The Phillies have the first pick in the draft, and uh, that makes it very interesting. The baseball draft, I'm going to ask Jonathan Mayo from MLB.com a little bit about the evolution of the baseball draft. Uh, A lot of times we all know the football draft, we all know the basketball draft and how important they are, Jonathan, but how important has the baseball draft become in recent years? Well, I mean, I think it's always been important. You know, one of the things that has made it difficult in terms of maybe marketing it or selling it is the fact that uh, the players who are drafted uh, take some time before they're playing on the on the largest stage. You know, and yes, there have been some Bryce Harpers and Mike Trouts uh, that have probably brought more attention to it because of how quickly they've gone to the big leagues. Carlos Correa. Uh, you know, but the the draft has only been on TV since 2007, uh, and it was always it's always harder to market because you know college football and college basketball are huge. Everyone knows all the players entering into those sports drafts. Even with uh, a relative explosion of college baseball that's on TV now, by and large, the the players being taken uh, aren't aren't well known and take you know three four years to to get to the big leagues. Yeah, and uh, you got high school players involved as well, and, and I guess uh, sure. that kind of throws some things off as well. Uh, this particular year, the Phillies do have the number one overall pick. Uh, give us a little insight on the top of that draft. Is, is this a good year uh, to have that top spot? You just mentioned some names that I think a lot of people are familiar with and how fast they got to the big leagues. Do you see a player like that at the top of this draft? No, uh, I don't. But you know, then again, Mike Trout wasn't that guy. You know, he went twenty fifth, uh, or you know, somewhere thereabouts when when he got drafted. So you never know. You know, if you talk to any scout, you know, every draft has all stars in it. But this is not a great draft. There isn't a clear cut number one. Uh, this isn't you know Bryce Harper, or Steven, Steven Strasburg year year, and that's why anybody who's paid any attention to the reports on, on what the Phillies are, are or who the Phillies are looking at, uh, the list doesn't seem to get whittled down. Uh, you know, there, I think there are certain guys that uh, they like, uh, but the, it's a fairly robust list, and I think they're doing their due diligence to try to figure out what they want to do, uh, some of which may involve, you know, being a little creative. Uh, baseball uses the pool draft system so you have a certain amount of money to spend on your top 10 rounds uh, and, and I think the Phillies are kind of looking at their first pick and then their second pick which is I think at 42 uh, as sort of a package kind of deal so they might take a guy who isn't necessarily the best player and I will reiterate there isn't one the best player save some money there and then be aggressive with a guy who may uh, may have uh, put out a, a big price tag in terms of signability with their second pick. Jonathan Maya with us. Jonathan, there's been some reports that Mike and I have seen that the Phillies are leaning away from Jason Groom, the local kid from Barnegat down this way. If that's not who their number one pick is, who do you think they should take at number one? Well, I you know, it, it's tough because the, the thing with, with a player like Jason Groom is, is that there is a, an inherent risk in taking high school pitching. And, uh, and and a patience that needs to, you know, to happen. Even if you think that Jason Groom might be the kind of high school uh, pitcher who can move uh, a little bit more quickly because he, he's got such a good feel for pitching, uh, advanced for his years. Uh, I think that the guy that the Phillies really wanted to run away and hide all spring was A.J. Puck, the, the, the big lefty from the University of Florida. And he hasn't really done that. It's been kind of up and down, uh, as it's been for kind of uh, for much of his college career. The stuff is always there, but you wonder why he doesn't dominate. Uh, last week at the SEC tournament, he had that kind of start where he looked like the number one pick, uh, and there were a lot of people there, and a lot of people think that that may have sort of sealed the deal. So, you know, my last mock draft that ran uh, late last week had Puck uh, back in the top spot and I think that if uh, if you're going to make me pick right now who I think they're going to take I think that's who they're going to take but there are a number of hitters that they are still exploring and just to follow up on Groom I know you saw him in Trenton versus Mondale uh, break down what kind of a player and, and what kind of an athlete you think he is for us 
Uh, yeah, that game in uh, in in Camden actually. Uh, you don't want to upset the the people oh, of Camden, sorry. New Jersey. Yeah, sorry, um, River Sharks that don't exist anymore. Yeah, please yeah, go ahead. <laughs> right, exactly right. But uh, that was about as much fun as I've had in an amateur game. You know, that wasn't like the College World Series. I mean, they packed that place, and uh, and he he really delivered. This is you know he, he's big and strong, but he's he, he's going to be able to add strength to what's a six foot five frame and. Uh, maybe six at six even and he throws three pitches so uh, he can throw all of them for strikes uh, the changeup wasn't working great that day but uh the fastball was very good and then about the third or fourth inning the curveball just really kicked in and it was unhittable it was one of the better high school breaking balls that any of us had uh, had ever seen and uh just those two pitches alone especially at the high school level where it made him uh really completely unhittable and what really stood out is him talking after the game. Uh, you know, they asked him about the start, and I think most kids, even those who were considered to be sort of top of the draft kind of guys, would be pretty pleased, you know, in front of uh, that kind of attention, uh, performing that well. Uh, what he talked about was that he left a couple of change-ups up in the zone and how he wants to be able to show uh, scouts or teams that, uh, that he can throw that pitch effectively. So uh, he is well aware of his, of his craft and what he needs to do to to excel at the highest level and the, that probably stood out the most but it was it was very very impressive uh jonathan mayo's with us mlb.com looking at the major league baseball draft and jonathan if groom is not on the phillies list uh and and maybe they decide against puck would there be other guys phillies fans should keep an eye on in that top spot are there other players because one area that they actually have some depth in this organization all of a sudden is pitching they can't hit a lick and they don't have a lot of bats in the organization currently so would there be an offensive player that makes sense there are i mean now typically when you're drafting at the very top you know you don't draft according to need uh, because you want the best player available. I mean, you're supposed to get the take the best player you can. Again, if they do more of a package thing still. Um, and you can never have too much pitching, uh, even if you end up using it as, as, as trade, you know, so be it. But, um, you know, there, there are a couple of college bats. Kyle Lewis from Mercer, his name has come up quite a bit. There's Nick Senzel, who's a, a third baseman. Uh, Lewis is, a, is an outfielder. If you really like him, you think he can stay in center. Uh, if you just like him, you know, a bit, he's probably a corner outfielder, uh, but still very good, uh, good offensive tools. Nick Senzel's a third baseman who can really, really hit advanced approach at the plate. Uh, those are the two college guys mentioned the most. Um, you know, every once in a while, uh, Corey Ray from Louisville comes up, but I don't think he's really in their plans. And then, the one high school hitter whose name has sort of popped up recently is Mickey Moniak. He's a center fielder from Southern California. Uh, there is no question he is going to stick in center field. He can really run. He can really hit. Started to show a little bit more power uh, uh, this spring, and that's why he's kind of moved up charts, and the Phillies were running in to, to see him. So he could be the kind of player where maybe they cut a deal, save a bunch of money, and then if someone gets pushed down to them, uh, a little bit later, they they have the money to spend. Mike and I were talking, Jonathan, about busts in the draft, though, too. It's not an exact science. I threw out the name <laughs> Jeff Jackson because that still makes me cringe as I think back. How do the Phillies avoid a bust? Which guy should they stay away from? Which guy should they avoid? That's impossible. I mean, that's really impossible to know. I mean, the one thing that I think teams do uh, a lot more now of uh, than they used to is – uh, really digging deep uh, into uh, make up any off the field issues. Uh, they have psychological profiles because it's not just about being talented. Uh, it's about avoiding the obstacles that can get in your way, uh, you know, and and, uh, and also having the just the desire because it's hard. Even even if you're real talented, it's a hard game to play. So I mean, there isn't a guy. Uh, that I can say at this draft class I was like, oh, stay away from, from this guy because uh, there are any of those issues. Um, but, uh, you know, there are the, the scouting staff. That's their, that's their job. Yes, they're primarily there to, to evaluate talent, but especially with the dollar figures that are associated with the picking at the top of the draft, uh, they do as much uh, as they can to, to ensure uh, that they're getting a guy who's not going to flame out. 
uh, I think they passed on Frank Thomas that year that they yep. took Jeff Jackson. I, I, I if memory yeah. serves, that, that <laughs> you shows could, you. You could do that with you could do that with every yeah. every draft. They, that, that just shows you the the boomer bust possibility. Tom you Goodwin mentioned, was in that draft. You too, mentioned uh, I don't know who that is. You mentioned oh. uh, Mike Trout as a, a guy that uh, fell all the way down the draft boards, but the Phillies. Uh, said not to be interested in Jason Groom. What is it about Groom that maybe they don't like? Well, I'm not in their draft room. Unfortunately, that would be a great place to be. Uh, but, I, I, I mean, I think that – and I don't think they've crossed him off their list, uh, mind you. I think it's more just a, a sense that I have that uh, they're looking in, in a different direction. And I think, uh, you know, you talk about the boomer bust of the draft. The biggest risk is high school pitching. If you hit – yeah, maybe you get Clayton Kershaw, terrific. But if you look through draft history and look at those guys who missed, the amount of those guys that are high school pitchers, uh, I would I would be willing to bet without having done the research uh, disproportionately uh, are, are, are high school pitchers. So uh, I think it would be more of a limiting or mitigating the risk, uh, you know, when a guy isn't necessarily the runaway number one pick. Now, if it was obvious that he was the number one guy, then I think that's a different story. But, uh, you know, you look over the history of the draft, there have only been three high school left-handers uh, ever taken number one overall, and, only, and and a high school right-hander has never been taken number one overall. Hmm. So, you know, you look at the track record, <laughs> and the lefties who were taken overall, one was uh, David Clyde, who got rushed to the big leagues right away and virtually destroyed him. Uh, so, you know, this was 1973, if uh, if I'm remembering my draft history correctly. So, it's almost uh, it's such a different era. Uh, the next, uh, Brian Taylor uh, was the number one pick of the Yankees in 1991, and he made it to Double A and flamed out. And the third was Brady Aiken, who you know didn't sign and turned out to have a bad elbow, needed uh, Tommy John surgery, and got taken uh, in the middle of the first round by another team the, the following year. So, you know, we're not exactly you know, looking at like, boy, why high school left-handers have really taken off when they're taken number one. So I think all that figures into the Phillies' thinking. All right, uh, the Major League Baseball draft uh, coming up next week. And, of course, uh, the Phillies own the number one overall pick in that draft. It seems like every Philly team is drafting one or two. It's a great year uh, to be in the draft class if you're a Philadelphia fan. Jonathan Mayo has more on the draft, MLB.com, at Jonathan Mayo on Twitter. Jonathan, thanks so much, pal. Thanks for having me.